awesome, man. Well, welcome. Yes, sir. Great to have you here. Thank you for this. Is, this has been one of the coolest experiences I've ever had, you know, coming out and, and, uh, thank you. Yeah, this is, this is amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It's been fun so far, man. Good, good to get to know you over the yes, last sir, couple You days. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. I'm, uh, Luke Caverns, uh, kind of a, uh, a rogue anthropologist, I guess. I, um, I got started studying ancient civilizations because of, well, I, I always had an interest, you know, uh, both my grandfathers, one was an explorer who, um, chased down lost Spanish gold. The other one was a, uh, a pastor, like a, a, um, a Baptist pastor. And, but he loved ancient history. He loved the history of the Bible. So I grew up with this, you know, on my dad's side of the family, this element of being, told about these stories of lost Spanish treasure in the deserts of West Texas and New Mexico. On the other side of my family with my other grandfather, I was talking about the biblical world, you know, the world that the Bible takes place in. Yep. And so that was kind of the onset of me being really interested in ancient history. And I wanted to know, uh, when I was at church growing up, you know, I, people, pastors, they tell these like, uh, half-hearted stories sometimes where they use elements of an ancient story to kind of fit something that's happening today. But I never really cared about that. I wanted to know, well, why don't you just tell me the story and and the purpose of the story should speak for itself. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know about that world. And so little did I know that was my first like longing for anthropology, archaeology. And then uh, pro when I'm in high school, I get exposed to Graham Hancock mm -hmm. and, uh, and Graham Hancock, I don't necessarily agree with, with all of his, um, you know, all of his views and beliefs, but he, I mean, the guy is, is an expert in antiquities and he's an expert in really specific mysteries of the ancient world. And he's great at extrapolating on the contradictions in archeology span that you yep. would have never known otherwise. Right. And so even if, I don't agree with his summation of evidence that he puts together. He opened me up to a world that I never knew existed, you know, yeah. all of these gray areas. And so, um, and so I'm like indebted to him for that. And, um, a lot of people are, I mean, he's done that oh, for a lot of people, myself oh, included. Mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, don't look him up on Wikipedia because you know they'll they'll tell you he's an absolutely crazy person with no credibility. But but he's a brilliant guy who's who's accomplished a lot and has shown yeah. a, shined a light on this whole this whole ancient civilization conversation. Yeah, I mean he he uh, yeah he started my whole. Uh, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here doing this, yeah. and, and maybe you wouldn't. Be I either. probably wouldn't and, either. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so he opened my eyes to a whole world. You know, I never knew about the Olmecs mm -hmm. before I read Fingerprints of the Gods. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, so I'm indebted to him for that. And, um, after that I started studying, I realized, well, you know, I want to do something cool with my life. You know, I'm going to have to figure out a way to, I, I tried these other careers. I, I tried going down different paths and none of it was really working out for me. And I just decided I love ancient history. I'm going to build a life, you know, where I can, be present with my wife and make a good living. However, I'm going to have to do that. That probably means I'm not going to be working for a university. I'm not going to be down in, in ditches at, in archaeological sites. I'd love to do that, but there's just not a living to be made there. And it's a really tough life. I mean, it's the life of an actor, basically. You take the best gig you can get. So my obsessions are the Maya and Egypt, mm -hmm. but I may not get that. I might get... Uh, a site that's out in New Mexico digging Mogollon um, native, you know, at, at a Mogollon native site. But I may not necessarily love that. And that might be stringent on my relationship with my wife, as is so common in archaeology. So I wasn't going to pursue that. And so I figured out, you know, people love ancient mysteries. They love all these little gray areas that Graham did such a good point in highlighting. Yep. And so I just decided I'm going to extrapolate on that. I'm going to get my degree so that you know, one thing that they attack Graham on is that he's not like a good old boy. You know, he doesn't have his degree. So I went and I got the degree. And in the process of getting the degree, I, I did learn to love ancient history, not just for these specific mysteries that go back to the origins of civilization, but ancient history as a whole. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think like mainstream and the academics, I mean, people rightfully go after them a lot. But there are a lot of people who sit in that camp 
that are just ancient history enthusiasts and they're great archaeologists. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, Dr. Bob Breyer. He's like the greatest Egyptologist uh, of our time right now. And such a nice, such a nice guy. Not dogmatic at all. He's he's like in his mid eighties now, um, but I've learned so much from his lecture series. And uh, you know, he that taught me just about the standard world of, of Egyptology. So, anyways, long story short, um, I come at the world of ancient civilizations and ancient mysteries from two different angles. I sort of started off as a totally on the skeptical theoretical side, you know, along with Graham Hancock. And then I got my degree. And so sometimes it's, it's kind of, blend. yeah. So yeah. sometimes it's kind of like, uh, sometimes it's kind of mind bending thinking about certain mysteries. Like we were talking about last night at dinner, because I do have an orthodox perspective, but my origins of how I got started in this lies in the theoretical speculative side, which I still hold on to. So a lot of times it's two different ways of thought battling against each other. And so sometimes my conclusions with things are either I don't have a conclusion or sometimes they're not as, uh, they're not as incredible or amazing or out there, but I try to be grounded in everything that I'm saying right. without, without minimizing the grandeur and the allure and the mystery of the ancient world, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right awesome. now. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's a really good balance. I could tell to you for, uh, from talking to you last night that, you know, you're not, you're, you're very much in the middle as it relates to the mm -hmm. whole ancient civilization conversation. You're not far to the right or far to the left. And so that yeah. was refreshing to hear your perspective, your point of view. You do have some really cool theories though. So, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, one thing I want to kind of extrapolate on that is, um, when I was first getting started, and I was just reading Graham's books. Anything that alluded to the idea of this Atlantean civilization not existing was immensely disappointing to me. And that's because that's where I was coming from. But then I started to learn and appreciate the perspective of, of these are worlds that are completely disconnected from us. Um, so the Maya world I, I'm really interested in as well is much more recent than dynastic Egypt, right. but it, it was on its own track. Like the, you know, um, let's, 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 let's say hypothetically, there was a world spanning civilization, you know, prior to the younger Darius, the end of the late Pleistocene, the, the, uh, before the beginning of the Holocene, which we're in right now. 12,800 years ago. -ish. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so say there was a civilization that existed then and it was wiped off the face of the earth. Civilization restarts. Humanity in North, Central, and South America is now on its own track. The Maya world is being built according to its, you know, to its own trajectory. It's a completely alien culture that has nothing to do with Westerners at all. So just because it's more recent, it's that's kind of like an obscure way to look at it because it was completely on its own track, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so it's a world that's completely disconnected from us, and I've learned to appreciate it from that angle. And then even when I think about ancient Egypt, I, I've now reached a point where the idea of what the ancients were doing in 1800 BC fascinates me just as much as what they may have been doing in 2500 or 3000 BC or mm -hmm. even you know, 12,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've learned a yeah, general appreciation for all of the ancient world. And I've come to a point where I'm now, n I don't really favor one side or the other. I think it's all immensely interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of where I've come from, but that took also years of studying it to, to really understand the appreciation. And when, when you're just getting into it, um, people are focused on their, that one specific interest of what they, you know, of what they want to be true. Um, and I understand that cause I felt the exact same way. Now I've reached the point where I think it's all insanely interesting. Kind of yep. like we were talking about with your vases, um, the provenance that they date back to yeah. is, and we'll get into it, but it, that is remote history. So beyond when you're going back further than 2,500 BC, you're going back beyond or 2650 BC, you're going back beyond the time of Djoser and Emotep who built the step pyramid. That's what they say was the first um, large stone building in the entire world. Um, I don't really believe that, mm -hmm. but that's what they say. They say that was the first pyramid of Egypt. And so when you go beyond that, we don't really have, um, at least up until recent history, there wasn't uh, lineages and lists of kings during that time. So you're talking about remote history that a lot of these vases are being built 
or being uh, crafted in, in a time when, when Egyptians are not supposed to have this kind of technology. And I mean, really, there's no evidence that they ever had the kind of technology. Uh, that's not me saying that they didn't do it, and we'll get into that. Yeah. But it's it's perplexing. And so like I was telling you, one, it's it's really, really insane if they did it far beyond the time of, of pre-dynastic Egypt. It's also insane if they did it during that time, like the provenance dates back to, because yeah. both of these things are contradictory to what traditional Egyptology says about the capability of Egyptians at that time. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just kind of want to extrapolate on uh, the, the entire ancient world is all a mystery, and the deeper and deeper you get, the more you realize just how much nuance there is to everything, and you kind of, then the lines start getting blurred between like, you know, a lot of people aren't enth as enthusiastic about something that's 4,500 years old or 5,000 years old as, as much as they are about something with the potential of being 12,000 years old. But the deeper you get into it, the more you realize how much nuance there is and the less the dates mean to you, you start to appreciate the mystery of all of it, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. they're all kind of just as significant, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah, yeah totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, so I just got finished talking to Ben Van Kirkwick, you know, and, yep. and Chris Dunn on the first couple of episodes. So um, awesome to have you here today to kind of follow them up. And <laughs> I, uh, I can't believe, <laughs> like, I cannot believe that I'm in the same sentence as these guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I just, uh, it's, it's amazing, man. Thank yeah. you. For, like, thank you for having me here. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Man, you got a lot to offer. You got a lot to, to talk about, to tell about. You've got an incredible amount of knowledge and on, on history and you've got a really good perspective on all of it. So thank you. Yeah. Looking forward to sharing that. Um, but yeah, since we're kind of in Egypt already, you know, what, what we're going to do is kind of a two part series. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll start with Egypt and then we'll head into Mesoamerica as part two. Yep. But as long as we're already in Egypt, why don't we start talking about the vases a little bit since we're kind of on that. Now, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the vases, the pyramids, and the Sphinx. Okay. With that you. sounds great. Yeah. yeah. So. I love how you have your, your podcast structured. Like you have it all, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. you have all of your questions lined up. Yeah. yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, that's 20 years of being, a, a, a you know, in a corporate environment kind of, uh, you know, you make sure you want to hit the, the high points and make yeah. sure that there's a flow that's good that the audience can kind of follow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. So, yeah. So thoughts on the vases. So amazing dinner with you last night. First off, getting mm -hmm. to know you, getting to know your perspective and your point of view. Got you in this morning, um, showed you the, the, some of the vases that that uh, that I've really been collecting kind of since I started, um, well, really since I heard Ben Van Kirkwick on the Joe Rogan uh, podcast about, uh, I guess it was January of this year. So able to show you those this morning and, and talk a little bit about those. And yep. you were pretty much blown away by them seeing them in person. Can you can you talk a little bit about Yeah, well, okay. So last night I was telling you about, uh, I was like, I was like, well, it's probably most likely that they're not 12,000 years old, which I mean, I still feel that way, yeah. but I definitely um, diminished the quality of the craftsmanship before I saw it in person. Cause I was like, I was like, I was like, yeah, there's what 30,000 of them in, in Joser's pyramid. You said speculated to be up to 50. Yeah. What 40 to 50 is a number that I've always heard, but <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so these are found in just, just for context for everybody, right? These are found in Djoser's Step Pyramid in Saqqara, Egypt. So it's at the Saqqara Necropolis. Um, the reason that it was built was because um, Imhotep was like the right-hand man to Djoser. And he was so exceptional in the world of, of ancient Egypt that, he's, that eventually he was looked at as a god. But really, he is the first Aristotle, the first Plato of the ancient world that we have record of. Surely there were people um, equivalent to him before him. Um, but he's the first guy that we have record of. So he's the first mathematician. He's the first physician. He's the first architect. He's the first guy who, uh, you know, as they said about a lot of Napoleon's advisors, he had the arts in his hand and the science in his head. You know, he was just, he could do anything. And so he wants to build, this is, this is the, um, I'll, I'll give some history as to, as to the traditional view on on what Egyptology says about why um, the pyramids were built, if if that's okay, if I can yeah. if I can go into that. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I know you said you want to mention pyramids later, but this kind of leads into the vases. Okay. So um, when you go back into remote history in Egypt, beyond three thousand BC, far beyond uh, the time of uh, 
I mean, even beyond the time of pre-dynastic, I mean, you're going that far in, in ancient history during the Nakata cultures, people were doing sand pit burials. So way out in the desert, they're taking, you know, um, you know, they, I guess for whatever reason, they didn't want to bury their dead in the town that they were in, but they took them far out in the desert and they would dig up the sand and bury the bodies. Well, what would happen just like when we, when our loved ones die and we want to go visit them, you know, go visit their graves, they would go back out and they would find the graves to be uncovered. But what would happen is the body was mummified. So the sand, it, mummification was by accident. Mm. They learned mummification by accident. Okay. And so the sand would dry up the body and perfectly preserve it. So they'd go out there and the body would almost look the way it did when they buried it. Uh -huh. So they started realizing the sand is now preserving the bodies. So over the course of 500 to 1,000 years during remote history, they start, they start, I'm guessing that a legend of mummification comes about where they realize that you know, they, they don't want the bodies to, you know, they probably start burying the bodies in a different way and the bodies deteriorate. And that isn't, they don't like that because they've been burying bodies in the sand for a thousand years and the bodies are preserved. So probably a legend emerges of, of well, the soul is directly attached to this body. So we need to preserve it. So we have to do it the same way that we've been doing it for a thousand years. So they go out and start using sand pit burials. Well, they would start, they would take royal people out there and, uh, you know, they would have like a, they would have like a, a mission kind of where, you know, uh, like a royal mission where everybody goes out and they honor this dead person and say it's a royal person, bury him with all of his vases and uh, pottery and, and all of his riches. Well, the people who were involved in that knew where the grave was and they would go back out and steal everything <laughs> from the grave. So that's how we get these vases, mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> one thing that's really interesting is during that time when Egypt is kind of getting its culture together and they're starting to learn things about mummification and everything, we're not thought to, they are not thought to have had the ability to be able to make these kind of vases, okay? As we continue, um, the Egyptians get tired of having their sand pit vases being, uh, being looted. Right. So they start using bedrock. Um, as as their as their grave, so they dig down into the bedrock, they bury somebody in it, and then they fill that in with rubble, and then put sand over it so it hides it. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is the people who dug the grave go back out and loot it, mm -hmm. and uh, and the only the only way we know this is is later on in history, it they start having documentation of of uh, I don't know probably around twenty seven hundred you know and increasing up to about 2000 BC, there's more and more documentation because Egypt is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you have people needing to write things down to keep everything organized. So there's like, uh, there are uh, criminal cases essentially where people are being tried for stealing or looting from the, from the burial that they dug themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is a common thing that happened all throughout Egypt. So the bedrock doesn't work either. So then they're like, well, what else can we do? All right, let's dig a grave in bedrock and then let's put a building on top of that and make the building impenetrable. Mm -hmm. And so that way people won't be able to do it, won't be able to get into the grave. So they build something called a mastaba on top of a bedrock. So you have a tomb that goes down into the ground, say 15 feet, and there's a chamber attached to it. Now, what's really weird is these very first, so this goes back to 3,000, 2,900, 2,800, 2,700 BC, you, you have these bedrock burials with these chambers at the bottom. But what's really strange is the sarcophagi that are in there. It, it's a solid piece of, it's a solid piece of granite or diorite uh, stone mm. in a giant sarcophagus. Mm -hmm. um, almost uh, the most recent one that I saw was um, in a documentary with uh, Dr. Bob Breyer. And What's interesting is, have you ever seen the sarcophagus, um, the sarcophagi that are excavated in Egypt as compared to ones that are excavated in ancient Japan and China? Have you no. ever seen this before? No. It's the same shapes in the same trapezoidal angles on the sarcophagi. Oh, yeah. Have you I seen, have seen this seen before? Those, actually, yes, yes. The very, the very, the oldest um, bedrock burial with a mastaba on top of it is the same sarcophagi. I don't think it's a surprise that all the way out in Mauritania, Africa, where the Eye of the Sahara is at, mm -hmm. you have something called called the Tishit or Tishite culture that oh. arises around 4,000 BC. Let's keep it PG on this channel. 
Oh, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, but you uh, you have a you have that culture that arises in Mauritania and all the way over to China. You have civilization all arising around four thousand or five thousand, four thousand BC. It starts growing yeah. across the entire ancient world. I don't think that's any. I don't think it's any uh, coincidence at all. Right. You know, I think it was all completely interconnected. And China it was as fierce as Egypt. But I guess, you know, by the time that recorded history is around, there's not as much contact. But I certainly think that there's some kind of communication there that's that's underappreciated. But mm-hmm. anyways, yeah. so so in this oldest um, Mastaba bedrock chamber, they find looters tunnels. People are just digging down somewhere else and still getting into the chamber. Mm. So then they're like, well, what are we going to do now? So they build an above ground burial. Okay. And, uh, and so they build a massive mastaba with blocks that are so huge that they can't be moved out of the way. Um, those still get, those still get broken into okay. through, through the ceilings. Okay. And so the idea is that these, is that it started in, in a sand pit burial, bedrock burial, bedrock with a top. Now they're not going to dig down in the ground anymore to prevent people from tunneling in. So now we'll elevate the tomb and put it in a building with blocks so big that people can't get in and violate the tomb anymore. Because the reason for this is because the pharaoh or the ruler believed that if his body was defiled, that his spirit would leave his body and that he wouldn't be connected to his ka anymore. So ka is the word for soul. Mm-hmm. And that uh, his soul would leave his body in the afterlife and he wouldn't have a life after his death. So the body had to be preserved. And this just evolves from, you know, ancient Egypt is a death cult. You know, they, I, I'm, I would assume from an anthropologist's point of view that over the course of in remote history, when people are starting to figure out the world, they go out and they see that these bodies are preserved. And like I said a second ago, a legend is built around this. Mm-hmm. And so over the course of a thousand years, what has that legend evolved into? Well, his soul is 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 still in his body and his body can't be defiled. Like, um, or we can't let his body deteriorate like these deteriorated over here in these tombs, you know? So they knew that the desert uh, naturally mummified bodies. So protecting the body is, is immensely important. So the the idea is that this eventually evolved into building pyramids these impenetrable you know fortresses that protected the body of of the pharaoh and that that was what the pharaoh himself wanted you know mm-hmm. that's where the idea of yeah, pyramids the comes from yeah you so, buy you buy that you buy the tomb theory in general as it relates to the large pyramids i buy it when it comes to saqqara okay. um, the step pyramid mm-hmm when I look at the Great Pyramids, but this conversation is flowing this way, I may as well get to it. Yeah. So here's the thing about all of your Great Pyramids. So you have about six of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you have my Dooms Pyramid, which it's collapsed, but then you have the Bent Pyramid, the Red Pyramid, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkure. And those are said to come just shortly after the pyramid, the uh, Step Pyramid of Saqqara. Now, in the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, from the uh, the Egypt's logical point of view, from the beginning of tombs all the way leading up to the Saqqara Step Pyramid, totally buy it. I think I think it I think it makes complete sense. You go look at these mastabas, like these structures that I was talking about, on top of these bedrock burials. The mastabas have stelas and rooms inside of them that acknowledge the presence of the ruler who's buried under the ground where you're standing or buried in the building uh, that you're standing in. Or they have stela that are outside of them. So a stela, for anybody who doesn't know, is essentially, it's like a billboard, basically, um, that's standing straight up depicting the ruler who is there. Mm -hmm. And so stela is one, stele is plural. Um, So you have stela that are there depicting the rulers who are buried there, talking about, um, you know, they're like, they're almost magical spells of what they're going to be doing in the afterlife, protecting their body in the afterlife. There are spells that are essentially cursing people who are to defile the grave. You know, it just a whole plethora of things, you know. So it makes sense in the beginning, at least. Mm-hmm. So. It makes it makes sense. And then all the way up to Joser's Pyramid, mm-hmm. even at Joser's Pyramid in Saqqara, you go inside, you go inside the pyramid, there are murals on the wall. Mm-hmm. There are uh, turquoise scarabs, you know, the, you know, like in the mummy, the scarabs that go underneath people's yeah. skin. Yeah. There are turquoise scarabs embedded in the walls, in, in, the, uh, in the labyrinths inside the pyramid. And those are meant to represent 
uh, Djoser's apartment that he had in Memphis, Egypt, because we found where his apartment was. And that is decorated with scarabs, these blue turquoise scarabs all over the walls. And he was paying rent. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so, but inside the pyramid, you again, you see the, you see a, uh, it's like a mock version of, of Djoser's apartment in Memphis, Egypt, built underneath the pyramid because that's where they thought that his body might reside after his death, that he needs to be in his apartment again. And there are murals and reliefs um, on one of these uh, like portal doorways. It's like a doorway that doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And you see a a, a hieroglyphic of, of Djoser standing there performing divine rituals, visiting sanctuaries in the afterlife. It's obvious that this building was 100% intended at least at some point, but I think it was built for this purpose mm -hmm. to be his tomb. Okay, so that precedent is set up. You have, that's 2650 BC. Mm -hmm. For at least the last five to 600 years, you have pharaohs burying themselves and honoring themselves in their burial. Pr prior to, to prior to the, you're saying after or prior to the, um, to Dozier's <clears throat> pyramid? Prior, prior, prior to Dozier's yeah. pyramid. Okay. You have this, you have this uh, sequence of, yep. Um, it's pretty obvious that that you can see an evolution in, in architecture of yep, tombs yep. and pharaohs are honoring themselves, their names are put there. So why after that you have this young boy who, to all the names I'm going to give you, there's no question as to whether or not these people existed. Seneferu, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkure, mm -hmm. everybody agrees that they existed. Whether they are responsible for the pyramids is the mystery. Okay. okay. So So the story is, and I'll tell the story, and then you'll see how it doesn't make any sense. The story is, Senefru is born several generations after Djoser. He's not Djoser's son. We don't really know quite what happens between Djoser and Senefru, but for some reason, the family family lineage doesn't continue, which is fairly common in Egypt. It's 3,000 years of, of history there. But you have this boy, Senefru, who grows up essentially in the shadow of Djoser's pyramid. And it is his life's purpose to build his great pyramid but he wanted to build a pyramid that was smooth on all sides he didn't like the steps that were in it he wanted perfectly straight angles so early on in his reign <clears throat> he starts uh he starts the construction of, of his first pyramid but for some reason the blocks aren't uh stacked together correctly and um uh, like the limestone that he used, I suppose, didn't hold up as well. Or it was like the outer casing stones that they used to make the pyramid smooth. Um, they Like on the Great Pyramid, a lot of the blocks are angled like this, where the, where the, the whole structure leans in on itself. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't do that. He stacked them flat, and the blocks weren't inter, interconnected or locked into each other. So the sides slipped down. And you can see that today. It looks like you can see the inner core of the pyramid is standing still, the outer core has just collapsed. It's like powder on the outside. Mm -hmm. And so this pyramid collapses. Well, then he tries again. <clears throat> and so he wants to build, uh, he want, his next pyramid is what we see as the bent pyramid. And, and does the timing make any sense as it relates mm -hmm. to like how long it took him to build the, the first one that collapsed? Or the <laughs> there, 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 I mean, he, I want to say he lived to his 80s. And yeah. I mean, you're looking at 20 years per pyramid, probably. Okay. Um, which is, a, it sounds like a long time, but it's not a long time for building a structure that, that's this big. Yeah. Maybe it's doable. You know, I mean, it's the the Great Pyramid is, the Great Pyramid is enormous, bigger than Seneferu's pyramids. And that one says it would, they said they did that in two decades. And of course that's refuted a lot. Um, you know, you would be need to, you would be needing to place blocks all day and all night for, for 20 years straight to be able to do that, which yeah. I just don't know how that's, I just don't know how with a structure, you know, maybe they had so many people working, um, when Herodotus visits Egypt, they tell him that I think there's 90,000, uh, the Egyptian scribes tell, told Herodotus that there were 90,000 people working on the pyramid at one time. Yeah. To, Which, well, it's a national project, right? That's what Zahi Awas would, would say. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Any, anything that doesn't make sense. But you're, you're quarrying, mm -hmm. cutting, transporting, placing. 
after designing somehow mm -hmm. um, one block, one massive block weighing a couple of yeah. tons every five minutes for like 25 years. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it, and, and you'd have to transport make a them. Lot of sense. You got to transport them down the Nile and the Nile was only high enough to be able to transport <clears throat> blocks that heavy for like three months a year or something. Well, you, they transported the, um, they transported the blocks that were used to line the inner chambers. So the, oh, right, 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 the right, mass right, right. amount of blocks come from where the pyramids are at. Yeah. So there's a quarry. When you're standing at the base of the pyramids, you just turn around and you can see the quarry still there. Gotcha. Right. Now, that isn't, still isn't an easy answer. And I'll get back to Sinefru in a second. But, you know, when people are, you know, when you talk about like cutting these blocks, the blocks are not uniform. The blocks are personalized to fit against the block they're sitting on the block they're next to the block they're the block that's going to be placed next to them right. and the block that's behind them right so like i was telling you yesterday a lot of these blocks even the ones that we see in peru are perfectly fit on five sides yeah you know yeah. on five sides some of them you know i guess those are the exterior ones and maybe the exterior blocks are the ones that, that look especially perfect you know i don't know if every single interior block is quite the same in these massive structures, it would have to be because pyramids are collapsing. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, he gets to building, uh, Sinefru goes from his collapsed pyramid to what we see today as the bent pyramid. And so what ends up happening, what people, you know, ancient architects look at it and they think is that it was built much too vertical and it was tremendously heavy. And the chambers on the inside of the bent pyramid are, are huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one of them, I think, is 50 feet tall, the inner chamber. and um, and it made the it made the structure unstable how vertical it was going and how heavy it was going to be and so they've kind of flattened off the top of it and he finished it but still didn't like it and then um and then he builds the red pyramid and there's not a lot of history about the red pyramid and um and i'm not sure exactly why egyptologists say attribute this to Sinefru. um I think I think that there's a there's a temple at the at the base of the red pyramid but I don't think that it has any hieroglyphs in it as far as I know the what they do to attribute these pyramids to uh, Sinefru is that there is graffiti that's found in the temples next to the pyramids and it's of people who traveled from so these are in the deserts of Dushur this is 15 miles south of Cairo Memphis Egypt and that's really the main hub of Egypt for a tremendously long amount of time, almost the whole history of, uh, of dynastic Egypt. And so you have these scribes who are basically going on these little vacations and they want to go down and see these ancient pyramids from a thousand years before. So a guy from, uh, I believe it's a scribe from, from 1800 BC, he travels down to the pyramids of Sinefru and he graffitis, I scribe, you know, whatever his name was, uh, came to visit the pyramids of Sinefru on this day. And he left this graffiti there. That's all the, that's, that's mm. like when you, that's why when you show me these vases, that's why I tell you, you're talking about remote history beyond belief because it's so remote that that's, that's the only kind of evidence we have to make any kind of connections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there was also a cartouche that was found in the bent pyramid. Um, that's like a little, uh, it's like a little, uh, a cartouche is like a little stone that's got his that's got Sinefru's name uh, written in it, and then it's it's encircled, and encircled makes the name sacred. It, it tells you that it's a king. There's a cartouche that was found in it. How arguable is it that that was brought in there later? Yeah. You know, we know that the pyramids were broken into. Yeah. Um, we know that they were probably looted of everything that was in there, if anything ever was in there. Right. Um, but the thing that just doesn't make sense to me is that you have Sinefru building these three pyramids and then his son Khufu is born. He builds the greatest pyramid of them all, the mm -hmm. Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Mm -hmm. um, I could go on about all the little cool stuff about it, but I think everybody gets the point. Yeah. His son builds a pyramid that's 10, that's 10 meters shorter. And then his son builds another pyramid that's about half the size. So you have four generations of pharaohs who build six what we would call great pyramids essentially with the first one collapse the outer the outer walls on it collapse but nowhere in these four generations did any of the kings have their names inscribed anywhere on the granite or limestone blocks on the insides of the pyramids when the progenitor of the pyramid builders did all of that plus some i mean he put turquoise scarabs inside of his mm -hmm, pyramid mm -hmm. so 
when you walk through the Great Pyramid, I'm not surprised that I'm not surprised at the aspect that there's nothing left in there identifying, you know, who it is as far as uh, material artifacts. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that pe- that is completely picked clean if there ever was anything in there. What surprises me is that there isn't anything carved to tell you whose pyramid it was when it was the biggest building project ever constructed on the face of the planet, even until today. Right, right. And and that ruler didn't think he needed to put his name on there. Even in the temples, uh, in the necropolis outside of the pyramids, you're not seeing the name, you're not seeing the names anywhere. It's a huge problem for Egyptology. <clears throat> a huge problem. It's the biggest, it's the biggest problem, right? Yeah. And really what uh why people think that these um why these pyramids belong to uh, let's let's talk about um let's talk about the the three great pyramids on the Giza plateau is Herodotus was a Greek historian who came to Egypt in 450 BC and does a great documentation of of Egypt and uh kind of like Solon you know he comes 150 years after Solon and uh and he travels to Memphis and some priests take him out to the Giza plateau and he asks them like, you know, how are these built? Who are, who are these built by? And they tell them, they tell them, uh, Cheops, Kefren and, uh, Menkerin or something like that, which translate to Cheops is Khufu, Kefren is Khafre and then Menkerin is, uh, Menkere. So, um, that's the evidence. Mm. Wow. <laughs> that's the whole evidence. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's little tidbits here and there, but that is the main glaring evidence that they use that, they say, they say, well, if there were priests here at the time that knew the history of Egypt, there probably were documents that existed at the time that they were aware of that yeah. we don't have access to today. And so they told Herodotus that, and that's all we can go by. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that's Any the car- carbon dating? <clears throat> um, no, no, not not inside the pyramids. Okay. No, I mean, there's there. Um, I think the only thing. I think one of the only things that could be carbon dated is the graffiti that they found in the relieving chamber above the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid. I suspect it's been carbon dated like Ben suspects, yeah. but we don't have the carbon date of that. Right. Um, but I don't know that that graffiti even proves anything because there are looters tunnels inside of the Great Pyramid and that would be a whole like rabbit hole to go down, dude. They, they, they dug underneath the pyramid and then dug a looter's tunnel into the blocks of the pyramid like chiseled out Mm. the chiseled out the limestone blocks and climbed up into the pyramid all the way back in antiquity you know Mm -hmm. thousands of years ago Mm -hmm. and so who knows what it what it basically says is khufu's gang was here that that's that's the translation right right and so what does khufu's gang mean here's here's a here's a theory uh, if Khufu didn't build that pyramid, he could have had a guy. He could have had a group of guys that he really liked, and he was like, "Go into that pyramid, and and I want you guys to dig into it. Mm-hmm. I'll fund it. I mm-hmm. want to know what's in that pyramid." Right. So Khufu's gang gets into the pyramid, loots it, and then writes a hieroglyph. Mm-hmm. Khufu's gang was here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It could be something as simple that as that. Be. I don't know. Yeah. It, but um, but I don't think that graffiti proves a lot. You right. know, when I, right. when I tell people like, "Well, there's no hieroglyphs." in the pyramids they go oh well, yeah there is there's there's a graffiti from uh that khufu's gang it's the builders that are there and it's like ah. you see how easily i came up with an with an alternative theory to right, that right, that's right. not it, you can't yeah. you can't use that as evidence yeah um so what do you think like what do you think in terms of the construction days <clears throat> well i'm um i'm i'm really skeptical of the traditional viewpoints that Egyptology has around it. What do I think? If I think that it, do I think it was, you know, something that was around 12,000 years ago? Well, the problem with that is the erosion on the pyramid wouldn't make sense. So the first two great pyramids, the casing stones are limestone. And you can see limestone that's been exposed for 12,000 years, how devastating it is to that limestone. Like, look at the Sphinx. The Sphinx, as as perplexing as it is, I think the Sphinx is really, really, really old. You know, I don't know, 12,000. It could be, I think people speculate like 26,000 years old. Mm-hmm. It could be. Um, yeah, I've heard I've heard 38. I've heard, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. you look at, I mean, the, the Sphinx is is completely messed up. You know, there's records of there's records of the Egyptians uh, 
fixing the Sphinx throughout the Sphinx entire history. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. obviously that thing is is really really old. Um, and you look at the effects of of, uh, of wind and sand and water erosion on the Sphinx, and it's obvious, glaringly obvious. Right. The casing stones at the top of the Khafre pyramid are still there, and you don't see the same kind of devastation of water erosion that you would if it was 12,000 years old, because that means it would have been built during the time of the African humid period. And so let's say it's 12,000 years old, or let's say it's built in 10... Uh, 10,500 BC. So, you know, 900 years before the end of the late Pleistocene, right? At the, the bang, the bang end of the younger Dryas. Mm -hmm. Um, and say it, and say it survives that cataclysm, whatever it is. It would have been in the Nile in a time when the Nile was tropical and receiving rainfall on a regular basis. That rainfall would make the pyramid look so much more devastated than it does today. Um, more similar to the kind of limestone erosion devastation that you see on the Sphinx. So... Because when do we see the heavy rainfall in that, in that uh, region? I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, let's, let's say at the, end, at the end of the time of the Younger Dryas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it is happening then during the African human period. That lasts until about eight to 6,000 um, BC. Okay. So... You're looking at three to four thousand years, maybe five thousand years of mm -hmm. rain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on a continual basis. Mm -hmm. Those those casing stones would not have been there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they would be almost completely gone. The casing stones at the top of of Khafre's pyramid still look perfect. Um, so it, even though the pyramid is at <clears throat> such an angle, I mean, and the you know the rain rain's going to fall on it and kind of just drizzle down it, as opposed to like it's it's really banging the Sphinx and it's it's kind of dripping over the walls of the Sphinx and you know there's a lot more weight and pressure mm -hmm. of the water coming over the walls of the Sphinx than there would be from from rainfall just kind of slowly gradually going down the side of a building. I would feel like I could see that argument. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I I think I think my gut tells me that we'd see more evidence. Um. You know, uh, I'll, I'll say like the uh, places like the Serapium. You know, you know what I'm talking about the yeah, giant do, yeah. boxes. Yeah. Are, are they diorite granite boxes? Both, yeah. And um, that the Serapium was buried. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew where the Serapium was uh, until an explorer found it. Uh, it's actually pronounced the Serapium. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so nobody knew where where the Serapium was, um, and then also nobody knew where the Osiris shaft was. So you're looking at these, you know, straight angled giant megalithic stones with no artwork or what whatsoever all these things were buried when i see something like that and it's completely buried it's protected i think maybe yeah maybe that maybe that's there's no telling how old that thing is the pyramids how you know they're how exposed they are i i'm dubious about it even though i know that that brings up so many contradictions because it's like well it's right next to the sphinx i'm saying the sphinx looks obviously older than the pyramids yeah. but i'm trying to be blatantly honest yeah. you know yeah. as odd as my conclusions sound when i say well this looks old and that doesn't look that old and you know yeah. i know that 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 that's a contradiction there but i'm being honest there's so many uh, there's contradictions any way you go with every this topic. everywhere and, and that's why we can still talk about it and have fun conversations yeah, about yeah. it because nobody really knows the answer to it, it i mean it's just theory exactly it's just guesses and you know it's kind of just a bunch of little pieces <clears throat> of a story that we're trying to put together exactly yeah. now here's something that i think is really interesting have you ever heard of the Nubian egg? Yes, I have. Yeah, it has okay. the pyramids carved on it. Yes. Yeah. That thing is so strange to me. It's really strange. That it looks like it's along the Nile, even though uh, even though academics interpret it as being uh, just a, like a snake. Right. You know, that's that's next to these sure. three mountains. Right, right, right. Well, <laughs> there are there are Nakata culture. So Nakata well, culture is... Well, explain what the Nubian egg is for people <clears throat> first. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So... So uh, the Nubian egg is a, um, I had thought it was an ostrich egg, but somebody it corrected me. Oh, really? I thought it was an ostrich egg, too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, somebody corrected me and said that it wasn't, but okay. I didn't really follow up on that. It's okay. an egg. Okay. You know, it's an egg that's about the shape of a globe, yep. and it's probably about this big or so. And um, and so it has a hole in the top of it, I'm guessing drilled to empty out the, the uh, can, whatever it contained, and, and the embryo. The non-ostrich. Yeah, 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 the non-ostrich, whatever that was. <laughs> And, um, and so carved on it 
are these two mountains, you know, it's what academics say, but they don't, but they're not depicted like, like mountains. They're perfectly straight, uh, steep triangles with horizontal lines drawn in between them, yeah. my opinion, to reflect, you know, what looks like the layers of a pyramid. Right. Um, <clears throat> and then there is a snake, which I really think is the Nile curving um, up and down on the egg just to the right of the pyramids, right where the which Nile would be, be, which would be just east of the pyramids, right? Right. If you're looking at it north south. Right. And then at the top of it, you see these concentric circles, which uh, maybe maybe it's similar to Atlantis, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe there's some kind of connection there. But really, the the snake that looks like the Nile and the three mountains that look like pyramids are what intrigued me the most. And so I started looking into this and thinking about it, and um, I made a post of it on Twitter just for fun. Like, anytime I come up with something... Some, Something that I acknowledge that I haven't usually acknowledged, I post about it on Twitter, see what people think. And uh, usually I get berated by like yeah. academics, you that's know. All, that's what Twitter does. <clears throat> oh, I got into, I got into about with a, with a, uh, a Twitter warrior archaeologist yesterday. And it's amazing how. X, a- whatever. Arrogant. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how arrogant a lot of these people can be. And the problem is they are, they sit so high on their horse they're so disconnected from the normal enthusiast that they can't communicate their ideas in any kind of way that sa- that sounds interesting at all. Um, <laughs> I, I forget whose quote this is, but you know, it's the archaeologist's job to bring the dead to life and not bore the living to sleep or bore the living to death. You know, right? right. And um, and so these guys are just very disconnected from what you know the audience they're trying to reach. They're disconnected from what from what makes from what interests them, right? Yeah. Science so, advances one death at a time. I feel like mm-hmm. with the new generation that's coming up, like people like you who have do have your degree and who have gone to school, you know, but also do have learned things from yeah. other people with, you know, open mind, Graham Hancock, for yeah. example, you know, other people that, that it's it's changing though over time. I, I think it's changing. And Graham Hancock has said that there's a lot of young archaeologists who uh, behind closed doors talk to him. They're like, I love your stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, even if I don't agree with like the end of your book, how you sum it all up, right. everything you brought up is so interesting. And I've looked into all of it and we'll get into it. But yeah. I have different, con- I have conclusions that I haven't heard anybody else come up with. Yeah. I would have never even gotten to that point if it wasn't for Graham. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. So um, uh, on the egg, any, any, any like, like what's your what's your what's your thought on the egg then yeah so getting back to that um you're a great host by the way you keep everything (laughs) like in line um so yeah so so this egg i post about it on on x and uh and people go people go oh no it's just it's just a nakata culture egg so the nakata culture is the egyptian culture that was around before um like even before pre-dynastic egypt it is pre-dynastic but it's really ancient it's like 3200 bc to 3200 to five six thousand wow. you know around okay. for a long time okay and um <clears throat> And so they carved a lot of things on on these ostrich eggs. Mm-hmm. And I had somebody I had somebody send me a photo, and I, I had seen this before, but um, it was like it was like no, these are just interpretations of mountains, as are seen on many other of these Nubian eggs. Well, you look at them; it's not quite the same. Mm-hmm. You look at the interpretation of mountains that are for sure mountains. It's not just three; it's maybe ten of them. And they're solid. They're filled in, you know, mm-hmm. and they're they're curved at the top. They're not pointed with horizontal lines in them. And right. there's a there's a clear distinction. Right. And this one specific, this notorious Nubian egg, is the only time that I have seen this specific depiction of mountains. Right. Mm-hmm. So I look at that and I think, hmm, it's really strange that it looks so much like the pyramids of Giza. Could they have? Could they have been around at that time? Possibly, because because the egg was carbon dated to like mm-hmm. seven thousand years ago or something like that. Seven thousand years ago, so five thousand BC. Yeah, 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 yeah. More than um, more than two thousand years before the you know twenty five hundred years before the Great Pyramids are said to have been built. Right now, could it have been? I mean, so obviously, I don't know the history of the egg itself, and to know well enough whether or not it could have been like if those pyramids could have been drawn in later at a later point in time. Is that <clears throat> no, 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 no? So um, they were in a Nubian um, 
They were in a Nubian grave. Okay. So buried. And in 1909, uh, an archaeologist found it in, uh, well, when I say Nubia, they're like Nubian people, Mm -hmm. but they were in Aswan, Egypt, I believe. So that's Upper Egypt, which is on the south side of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so they find this Nubian grave um, in Upper Egypt, in Aswan, Egypt. They dig it up, carbon date the bones. So we know it was buried in 5000 BC. Okay. So it's strange that it seems to so clearly depict you show that to anybody that's their first thing that's the great pyramids mm-hmm. you know yeah um and so when i think about that again it's one of those compelling things where it's like maybe, yeah. maybe they were around then yeah you know yeah. maybe somebody saw that and they drew it on they drew it onto this egg and they were eventually buried with it so now it gets to the inevitable um you know, question of what, what would they have been, you know, why were they built? Um, in my mind, I don't think, I don't immediately think of the power plant uh, theory. I don't think that they were magical. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes Egypt so great is their ability to, uh, is their agriculture, their ability to manufacture, harvest and grow food. That's why Egypt was so powerful. It was their grain, Rome needed their grain. Heck, even France needed their grain just a few hundred years ago. Um, you know, the Nile River, it, 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 like Egypt itself is a gift from the Nile to the world. The Nile River created ancient Egypt. Mm-hmm. The reason that we're all talking here today is because of that river. Mm-hmm. So the river overflows on an annual basis and it brings this like, it creates this rich topsoil. So it, it overflows and they they thought these gods were unlocking chambers deep down inside the Nile and caused the Nile to overflow. What overflows onto the land and it, and it brings this rich red topsoil and it allows, it allows Egypt to bloom in the middle of a desert. You know, it, it's like a truly remarkable thing. Yeah, it's crazy. And so the idea of the pyramids and I've seen people try to demonstrate this before, and I think it's the most reasonable thing, aside from it being like an insanely grand tomb that's the biggest building project ever, that the guy was like, ah, my name really doesn't need to be carved anywhere right. here. You right. know? And I don't really want to be in the in the <clears throat> subterranean chamber. I'm going to go to be in the queen's chamber. I don't yeah, really yeah, want yeah. to be in the queen's chamber. I'm going to be in the king's chamber. And, yeah. and what's this grand gallery thing for? <clears throat> like, yeah, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it makes no sense. The tomb theory... Is I mean, for me, it's the it's the least likely. But you know a lot more about this than I, I do. I think I think it's probably I think there's probably only two possibilities okay. in my mind. Is that either, and I don't know. Wh- I don't, I honestly don't know which is more likely because you know, in my mind, the pragmatic part of me is like is like, ah, eh, maybe it's just a tomb. Yeah. But that really just doesn't make that much sense right. because look at the tombs before that. Before that, mm-hmm. you know, look at Joser's step pyramid of Saqqara. You walk into that tomb and you look around or you walk into the pyramid, look around. OK, yeah, I know who this was built for. It's, you know, if this is Matt Bell's tomb, your name is written all over it. Right. You know, pictures of you are are, yeah. are inscribed everywhere. Neon signs and shit. All over yeah, yeah, place. yeah. All yeah, over yeah, the place. Yeah. And and but you don't see that at all in these pyramids. Yeah. Now you see a uh, in the Great Pyramid, at least you see a sarcophagus. It's not, dude, it's, it's literally nothing compared to the bedrock sarcophagi that are found out in the middle of the desert. Right. It's, it's not even close to being that elaborate. Mm-hmm. And this is the most powerful pharaoh, supposedly, that ever lived up to this point. Yeah. And his sarcophagus is like this thick granite. I mean, that, that looks impressive. It's not impressive when you look at obscure pharaohs uh, granite sarcophagi that are lowered 20 feet into the ground into this chamber with right. walls that are this thick on right. the sarcophagi with a with a a a, um, a lid that's this thick and eight feet long you know yeah it's it's nothing and then there's not even a lid found to the sarcophagi that's that's in um to the sarcophagus in the king's that's chamber. in the king's chamber there's right. not even a lid there right and if there was a lid they couldn't have gotten it out right, because right. this because the sarcophagi is bigger than the doorway. So it's just yeah. uh yeah. There's so many yeah. Yeah. So contradictions. I try, I, I try to never take anything too 
um, zero or to a hundred percent exactly in terms yeah. of like beliefs. Like I don't, I don't, I'm not a belief based person. I, yeah. I, I, I try to just keep an open mind to everything, exactly. all possibilities, exactly. all ideas. And just like, Hey, there's a certain percentage chance that this is likely. There's a certain percentage chance that this theory is likely. Yeah. Tomb theory for me is a low percentage, but of course it's yeah, yeah. still possible. But then in terms of other theories, mm-hmm. I mean, have you heard of the, um, the land of Kim? I have. Yeah. I've okay. spoken to him a little bit. Have you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to chat with him about his theory because, you know, that's an interesting one, but, and we don't yeah. have to get into it, but, but essentially, um, what, do, do you want to talk to it for well, just a quick um, second? Yeah. I, it, it's tough. I wish I had all the time in the world to dig into everybody's, know, you know, personal know, theories, know. but this one's um, good. But I know, I know he thinks that they could have been uh, chemical processing plants and he's looked into the diagrams of each of them. And, and uh, the only thing that I guess, uh, my initial possibly uneducated in his realm and probably ignorant thought a little bit is uh, I feel like that would be easy to test. Mm-hmm. If you got the permission to do it, you should be able to find the remnants of, uh, you know, I feel like, well, I, I've heard I've heard that when you walk into some of the pyramids, you smell ammonia right, or right. things like that. So um, I feel like if they were chemical processing plants, um, it should be easily testable if yeah. you can get the permission to do that. Mm-hmm. That part's mm-hmm. not easy. Yeah. Um, right. I think that's perfectly practical. Yeah. I think that's kind of adjacent to when I when I really think about like, well, what could it have been? Um, because I for preface for everybody, I don't just focus on the pyramids of Egypt. Like that's somebody's that's a lot of people's main priority. It's sure. a big interest of mine, but mm-hmm. it's not my main focus. But when I really think about um <clears throat> when I really think about what it could have been used for. Um, agriculture is, is my, is my first, Mm -hmm. is my first, uh, thing, a ram water pump theory to garden the area that, that the pyramids are around. You go out to the, you go out to Dashur, Mm -hmm. it's flat farmland right, right around there, all the way up to the base of, of the Maidum pyramid is farmland. So possibly, possibly some kind of water pump to, you know, um, to fertilize the fields that are around it. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. okay. maybe I think something like that is practical. Um, but I'd love to dive into, I, I'd really just love to meet him and have a conversation with him yeah, at some sure. point, Land yeah. of Kim. Yeah. Um, but my mind, if it's not a tomb, which when I think about it, it just, it just doesn't make a lot of sense that those great pyramids are tombs, but you know, I'm open to it. Of, of course I'm open to it. Um, but I'm going to say it's 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 some kind of purpose to make Egypt a greater, more powerful country. So either, yeah, maybe they were using chemicals of some kind or they're, you know, they're processing chemicals of some kind for some type of purpose, maybe not agriculture. I'm not really sure what his... Uh, what his proposed purpose of them is. Do you, are you, I mean, you probably Yeah, uh, I think um, essentially methane, like creating mm-hmm. methane for farming. And one, okay. one of them was maybe, I think that was the Saqqara uh, mm-hmm. pyramid, but he had different, I, th- I think, I want to say one of them, this is probably completely wrong, but I want to say one of them, you know, all the blue paint that's found throughout mm-hmm. um, Egypt mm-hmm. and throughout like Mesoamerica in ancient mm-hmm. times. He thinks that potentially one of them was creating that. I I, I don't want to misquote him, but well, you know, they don't even know. They, I mean, they don't even know how the Maya made their blue paint. Exactly, they don't even know where that came exactly. from. Exactly, right. That that's what made it interesting to me. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it's an interesting theory. So, I mean, you got yeah. tomb, you got you got a chemical plant, you got power plant, you got potentially a big sprinkler. <laughs> kind of a sprinkler. It's like a. It's like a. Have you ever heard of the ram water pump theory? Uh, no. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not an expert in this, but when I hear people talk about it, I don't think it's on. It's an unreasonable idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, the ram water pump theory is that. Um, so you know, there's evidence that at one point in time, the Nile River diverted off the Nile and ran right up to the pyramids right. uh, of Giza. Right. Right. And. There's just an idea. I'm not exactly sure the process by which people speculate that this was done, but I think people have built models of the Great Pyramid, at least the Great Pyramid, and have proven that it could be possible. But it like, I guess it brings water in and pumps water back out and fertilizes the land Got it. around it. So yeah, like that an could inch certainly sprinkler, be. I mean, you that know, could, that <clears throat> makes a lot of sense. Sounds. I mean, um, it's an elaborate you know thing to do to build a water pump. Uh, because the Egyptians already had shadoofs to be able to, uh, a shadoof is just like a machine that they built to get water out of the Nile to water their crops. So I don't know. It's, it's an elaborate way of building a ram water pump. Um, but I think it's something practical, you know, um, I, uh, 
I don't really have much of an opinion on when people, you know, give it some kind of uh, higher, higher purpose, you know, some kind of uh, really elevated kind of technology. How do you, you know, there's no way to prove that. Right. So um, I don't really think about that too much because yeah. there's not a lot of concrete uh, stuff there to dig into. Right. But the practical solutions are the things that, that interest me the most because it could be proven someday. Yeah. Um, well, so that's and, kind of where and, I'm And at the practical, um, uh, approaching it from a practical standpoint just makes sense mm -hmm. because of the, just the precision involved with the manufacture of it. Like it was, it seems like it was meant to do something. Like it was doing something. It was performing some function. <laughs> The Great yeah. Pyramid specifically. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, but I mean, it, all of them. That I think that's. Per, I think I think it's perfectly reasonable for anybody to to think that. You know, there's yeah. so many strange things about them. So, yeah. long story short. Yeah, we're getting, back to the vases. Getting to the vases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we kind of did it out of order there. Yeah, um, cool. No, that's great. So, <laughs> now that everybody has kind of an understanding of what's going on in Egypt, all yeah. right. So when we're talking about these pyramids, let's put them in context you know egypt's logical context that's around 2500 bc mm. um so and then and then uh Djoser's pyramid the I, I guess i would say the end of the evolution of what we know of pre-dynastic old kingdom what we know that they were building at that time without a doubt for tombs from the sand pit burials bedrock all the way up to saqqara's pyramid let's 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 exclude the other great pyramids for now we know that that was happening from 3100 to about 2650 BC. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is these uh, vases that you have here, and I'm not an expert in the type of, um, so what, is this granite here? That is um, <clears throat> granodiorite. Yeah, yeah. So it's either diorite or granodiorite. <clears throat> and sometimes it, they're both, right? Like the, yeah. the stones are mixed in together. Yeah. Um, so these, a lot of the collection that you showed me, I mean, I think almost all of it is very early old kingdom pre-dynastic so you're going back at the least from the dates that i saw 2800 bc to 3500 bc okay <laughs> that is it's hard to convey how mind-blowingly ancient that is because there's just no documentation of of that time of history we have the narmar palette which is like uh 3000 3100 BC and it depicts Scorpion the second so the Scorpion King that we hear about you know uh like there's video games made about him there's the there's the uh the Dwayne Johnson movies that are made of the Scorpion King that was a real king he was Scorpion the second his father was was uh, Scorpion the first obviously mm -hmm. but Scorpion the second is a guy from Upper Egypt um so he came from a city i believe called uh, Hierakonopolis and so this is uh, near Aswan. So before the time of 3100 BC, Egypt is divided. The, and, and because they're divided and they're warring against each other, they're getting raided by barbarians from the Middle East that are coming out of the deserts. Like Egyptians were solely dependent on the Nile. They did not go into the Mediterranean. They were not, uh, much to many people's surprise, there's no evidence that they were seafaring really to any major extent at all. Right. Um, There's like one boat found that was like a river boat pretty much, right? <clears throat> Um, well, we found boats, but the okay. river boat that you're talking about is Khufu's boat. Okay. And, uh, I, that's probably what you're talking I about. I think so, yeah. And, uh, that's the boat that they think that he may have sailed on in his final journey. Like after he had died, they put his body on it. I'm sure I believe that, you yeah. know, it looks rickety, you know, I mean, yeah. I believe that they built it, you know, yeah. um, that's not to discredit the Egyptians, but it just, it's, it looks believable that they, that they definitely did it. Yeah. Um, sorry, I took you off track. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> But the Egyptians also referred to the Mediterranean as like uh, oh, as the as like the Great Green something. But they didn't want to sail out into the in, into the Mediterranean. And also, you think of Egyptians as being in the desert. No, 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 no. They were in the tropics, right next to the Nile. I mean, right next to the Nile. Mm -hmm. They did not want to go into the desert because what's in the desert? Barbarians that are waiting for them. So. You have uh, you have North and South Egypt, which is upper and lower. Lower Egypt is in the north. Upper Egypt is in the south because the Nile runs north. Okay, <clears throat> so you have these two factions of Egypt warring against each other, and neither of them are winning for at least a thousand years. You know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of warring against each other, constantly being raided by, by barbarians. And Scorpion II decides that he's going to unite Egypt. So he goes up 
to northern Egypt. And we don't have the name of this ruler, but he's depicted on the Narmar palette as grabbing the ruler um, by his hair and the guy's on his knees. And he's got his, uh, it's like a blunt, uh, you know, kind of like a bashing weapon, uh, like a baton kind of. And he's in this smiting pose where he's going to smash his skull and yeah. declare himself declare, declare himself king of both lower and upper Egypt. He's going to unite the land and declare himself a god. But he's not a barbarian. <clears throat> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, you know, I don't know. But, uh, no, I'm just playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so one thing at the, at this point in time, and then I, I, I am getting to the vases, but I'm just building up the context yeah, around these vases, totally, how, totally. how, yeah. you know, uh, cause I think an anthropological point of view of the vases, people point out how amazing they are all the time, but the history in which, right. with which their provenance is dated to right. is important because it adds to the context, to the the context of yeah, it. Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, so he unites the land of upper, of upper and lower Egypt and he's depicted on the Narmor palette. After that, we have this like dark period in Egypt where for whatever reason, it probably wasn't a dark period at that time, but from a historical standpoint, it, everything goes dark from 3100 BC, 3000, 29, 28, 27, 26, boom. Uh, all of a sudden, Jozer is here. Jozer builds this pyramid. Emotep is immortalized. Jozer is immortalized. And then all of a sudden, you know, Egypt is roaring, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we have this five or 600 period five or 600 year period of, of like remote antiquity where there's not really any surviving documents. We've only just recently found King's lists that kind of go back beyond Jozer getting closer to the time of Scorpion. Um, so this is remote, remote antiquity. Um, the people think about Moses in the Bible. He was born in, he was born in Egypt. Um, that would be around 1350 BC. That's remote history. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're now talking, a thousand That's years before a thousand years before that is 2300 BC. That's still not as old as Joser's pyramid. 2300 BC is 300 years after Joser's pyramid. Right. So you go back 300 300 more years. Now you're now you're you're so far into ancient history where there's absolutely no documentation. I mean like you're you're heading off into like the opposite side of the solar system or, right. or of the galaxy at this point. Right, you know, right. it, it, it's a world that we know almost nothing of. The only thing that remains is like the stone, you know? Yeah. And these. Yeah. And obviously stone, but... Yeah. Um, and so the Egyptians, according to traditional archaeology, are not said to have... are not proposed to have the capability of, of really, really fine craftsmanship at this point in time. Uh, back beyond... 2600 BC, especially 3000 BC, especially 3500 BC. Right. But yet, but yeah, there it is. But yet these vases exist and their yeah. provenance in some cases goes back to 3500 BC. Right. Uh, uh, the difference between 3500 BC and and the ruler Scorpion II in 3100 BC uniting Egypt and making Egypt powerful, declaring himself a god king that can do whatever he wants. And Egypt starts roaring at this point. You know, technology is picking up really fast over the course of the next almost a thousand years. But 400 years before he existed, they were doing stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. 400 years is a long time. That's more than the entire history of the United States. Right, right. So, and think about everything that we've done yeah. in, in this amount of time. So, that's crazy. You're talking about, you know, many of these vases. I can't believe I'm holding this. <laughs> <laughs> many of these vases come from a time that we don't know anything about yeah. anything at all and for i don't know for for academics and egyptologists to dismiss this um as though it's not as grand as it is um is is mind-blowing and and um I, I just don't understand why this isn't a bigger mystery. I mean, I I understood it as soon as I held it, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen one of these and held them, I don't know how you do it, but try. Yeah. Try to, um, you know, experience one of these things and, and hold it for yourself because, man, it's got it's got an insane amount of weight to it. The symmetry is, is amazing. Um, when you reach inside and you feel the grooves on the inside, all of this is said to be done with either hand tools or very primitive like machines. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, what are they like? Like, like bow drills. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard of that before? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
bow drills, lathes, things like that. Yeah. Um, which I'm not an expert in, in but they machining didn't, of things. But the, with the wheel, they didn't have um, <clears throat> access to the wheel. The lathe is, is sort of an advanced form of the wheel even, right? <clears throat> and so the questioning, even yeah, whether or I'm, not they had the, the lathe at that point. Yeah, I'm not an expert on, on machining. Yeah. But, um, but yes, the wheel, the Egyptians knew about it, but they didn't use it because wheels weren't, uh, if, if they're... I don't know. I don't know. There's just yeah. not a lot of evidence for for the wheel. I mean, we we see it on their chariots, right? But their chariots, you know, that's you're not carrying, you're not bearing a huge load because wheels wouldn't have they wouldn't have really worked that well in Egypt. But they knew about it. Right. There are um there are Egyptians' children's toys, as we see all over the world, where a children's toy of a uh, a horse or a camel or something like that can be rolled back and forth on wheels. But we just don't have the evidence that they were using wheels in their machinery, um, let alone for travel. I mean, all of their, um, all of their giant statues, like we have, a uh, we have Colossus, um, we have, we have reliefs and hieroglyphs that depict them moving Colossus statues. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you see, you see like 500 men pulling this thing through right. the desert. They didn't even use a wheel for that. For right. the reason, I have no idea why they did. Right. Maybe they couldn't, probably obvious that they couldn't get a wheel that could bear that kind of load. Yeah. Um, maybe yeah but uh yeah it's just it's completely inexplicable yeah so so if you think about the the vases and and so the scene on the wall or whatever ben refers to it as is mm -hmm. is the the stone uh or is it's the the jar making scene where um yeah um uh, ryan can you maybe uh look up the uh that for us yeah but, that would be great yeah but it, it looks what it looks like is a scene where the egyptians are depicting themselves creating um, jars that are alabaster jars that are, okay. you know, and alabaster is of course much, much softer. It's a three on the most hardness scale mm -hmm. out of 10, as opposed to these, which are, you know, can be six, seven, um, seven plus on the most hardness scale. And so the difficulty of working something like this is extremely, extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, uh, like marble is a three. And so the statue. Oh, is it really? Is, yeah. Yeah. The statue of David is a three. Uh, you know, very easy stuff to work with. Alabaster can be translucent when you look at it because mm -hmm. it's so easy to work with. It, it can be brittle and, you know, um, um, and so Ben is convinced that the, um, that the, that, that, that scene shows the Egyptians working on um, alabaster jars and vases because they're much bigger and, and traditionally, and what we see coming out of, Egypt from um, mm. an alabaster standpoint is usually much bigger than these hard stone bases. <clears throat> it, it, yeah, if there was a way to find the uh, historical time of that, right. that could do a lot as well. Right. Uh, I'm big on timelines because the timeline tells you everything. For sure. And I guess that comes from like the traditional study of Egyptology because you break Egypt up into uh, different eras and you know kind of what they were capable of and what they were working at that time. And it'd be interesting to know because I'm sure he knows. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but he does. I, I, haven't heard, I haven't heard the date of that. <clears throat> of that scene, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'd love to know what era or kingdom that it was in. Yeah. Um, and that could kind of do a lot because you would do, at that point, you would practice relative dating. Right. So I'm guessing if he thinks it's alabaster, it's at a time when a lot of alabaster is being produced. Right. Boom. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's like simple archaeology, you know? Right. Right. Um, so uh, I... I don't doubt. Yeah. I don't yeah. doubt what he's saying. Yeah. So, so we'll get you, I know you were talking, we'd like to get you back on and we'll, we'll do a full video on the basis. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause it's, it's, um, you know, I'm not an expert on these things. I have been hearing about them right. since Ben, you know, has, has really started projecting this out. Right. Um, but I know that, uh, Alex Dunn and, and his group is yep. also, is also working on examining these. Yep. Um, <clears throat> now, yep. Yeah, they're coming on next week. Actually, we're okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can't yeah. wait to watch that. Yeah, then. yeah. Dude, you're doing such a good job at like oh, thanks, getting man. these guests, and you're a great host. You, you know, you're you're educated on on this topic and everything. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> now I'm not an expert in these vases and the machining of them. Great thing is that all these guys are. What I can do, we make a video together. Is I'd love to be able to, uh, after I do like a like a good study on it. Um, I want to be able to convey the world around these vases and really extrapolate on how strange it is that they were made in the time that they were made in and that they're not made, you know, like I was telling you, 
during the time of Ramses the Great. Yeah. He's the longest reigning pharaoh of, of, of Egypt. You know, he lived to be 90 something years old. I think his, or maybe the second longest reigning pharaoh. Egypt was at its uh, empirical or imperial height at the time, military height during the time of Ramses the Great. If you were to tell me that these were made during that time, that, that makes a little more sense. Makes a little more sense. Mm -hmm. That's about 1300 BC. Mm -hmm. A lot of people speculate it's the exact same. It's at the time of Moses. You know, they're not constructing pyramids at that time. They're about to start making obelisks. Um, but it would make a lot of sense. Yeah. But when these go back to the very obscure, very shadowy, mysterious, right. unknown frontier of incredibly ancient prehistoric Egypt, right. when they're not at all supposed to have the capability of making something like this. Right. That's freaking crazy. It's freaking weird. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And then, and that's kind of the minimum date, you know? I mean, they're yeah, kind of it's the minimum. It's, it's the minimum it's date. So, because you can't date stone. Yeah, can't date stone, and it's it's crazy either of two ways. Both, it's only one of po one of two possibilities, and they're both crazy. If it was made before the time of the Nakata cultures, let's say let's say these are twelve thousand years old, mm -hmm. they would look exactly like this. Mm -hmm. They're they're not these things are not going to deteriorate, especially. I mean, they're they were definitely buried, uncovered somewhere. You know, if right. Egy if the pre-dynastic, prehistoric Egyptians, the Nakata culture, found these, they're going to look exactly like this. Right. These aren't. You know, um, they've certainly been unless they get hit by a cataclysm or something. You know? Right. Right. They've yeah. cer certainly been underground for the <clears throat> vast majority of their life, which is yeah. why they're you know relatively preserved. So yeah. yeah. And so that's crazy. Yeah. So if they, uh, if the if the Egyptians prior to the old kingdom did craft these, that's still crazy, right? Because they're not supposed to have the ability to do something like this. And again, like I have to the the interior of of these vases mimics the exterior, so it's not just like a uh, it's not just a straight vertical hole. You know, maybe you could do that. Maybe if you Right. tried hard enough and drilled hard enough and fast enough and had something that was that was hard enough or maybe just, yeah just slightly more dense you could drill a straight hole but there had to be such expert craftsmanship to make the in to make the interior wall and the exterior wall parallel to each other right it, and then the bottom of them like you said the bottom of them are concave so they all sit on like a like a millimeter you know like a ballpoint area um which is yeah just, that that one in your hands is crazy because it's like yeah like you said the the, mm -hmm. the insides the same as the outside so the wall thickness is essentially the same throughout you know relatively yeah. close you can see the tool marks inside they haven't been as finely polished as the outside has been which is another complete mystery but but yeah if you if you um and 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 this is on a video that Ben created where we took that to um, Danville metal stamping and we mm -hmm. measured it with very sophisticated metrology equipment and yeah. the outside of it is within just three or four or in a lot of cases, thousands of an inch wow. of perfect symmetry. Three or four thousandths of an inch. I mean, that's that's the width of a human hair. It's and and for, yeah, a, for an artifact wow. that's that's five thousand years old, you know, you're going to have erosion. You're going to have, you know, just from handling it, you're going to get that amount of. Yeah. You would think you would get that amount of, um, you know, variance. So. Um, it's very strange. It it really is a complete mystery. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast, because there's so many mysteries that are worth exploring and, yeah. you know, talking more about and, and sh shedding some light on. And um, certainly the basis is. is oh, a, is yeah, this is one. this is amazing. So one thing that we were talking about, when we were talking about, like, maybe there's a potential functionality. Again, the pragmatic side of me thinks that uh, maybe no functionality other than just to be like, uh, Maybe no functionality other than to be what your decor is right now. Yeah. You know, but it's but it's a um but maybe there is some kind of um esoteric kind of meaning behind all of it, that they're able to encode their mathematics in it and show, you know, and maybe coding encoding the mathematics isn't like necessarily front of mind intended, but it it is a byproduct of the means by which they were creative right created sure. is that if that makes sense yeah could be yeah. and so and so when i think about like uh like you were showing me earlier with this guy right here so this is 
Is this the one that's a little translucent? Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. So I have to be right really there. careful holding this one. Yeah, yeah. Now this one goes back to when 3100 to 3500 BC. Correct. All right. So this is before Egypt, as we know it today, existed. When when Scorpion unites unites Egypt and Egypt begins to rise to its greatness, this is before that. Right. <laughs> Makes no sense. I just I that that's so hard to explain. And then so shine a light in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For anybody that. watching, yeah. they they have a they intentionally created a thin band around the center of it that's almost translucent. So what Matt was showing me was when you take a light and shine it inside, it's translucent and can be seen through. And so what it immediately made me think was during the time of the ancient world, what if you had something burning in there? That mm -hmm. might look pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It looks like a looks like an ancient lamp of some kind. Yep. And so what I what I immediately thought is, well, this is some kind of uh, this is some kind of very exquisite, very extravagant piece of decor that only somebody really wealthy could afford to have done for them. Somebody, somebody like a pharaoh, mm -hmm. like a like royalty, and that's when I told you th this could have been in the same room as Scorpion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I I guarantee you a pharaoh was in the same room as as one of these pieces that you have. Yeah, because this is this is as nice as it gets. That's crazy to think about. And uh, and these were obviously handed down. Um, these were obviously handed down throughout throughout history. So, you know maybe multiple pharaohs right and so i wonder if you know at night things like this sit up on a shelf you put a you burn a candle inside of it and it's some kind of it's some kind of lamp but it obviously is a display of your immense amount of wealth mm -hmm. you know to be able to afford to have something like this made for you mm -hmm. you know um if not that maybe there is some kind of purpose to it i know that that's certainly proposed um although i don't spend much time looking into what the purpose of the vases could be also because i haven't seen the vases with my own eyes now i'm like i'm gonna go back to ben's channel and watch all of these from the beginning yeah, because yeah. when you don't see it with your own eyes and and hold it and put your finger inside of it and yeah. feel the grooves on the inside yeah. you can't understand i mean this right. is, this has opened me up to a whole world you know when i watched his last video um of you guys going to uh the duns you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. factory or whatever yeah um i kind of just had it on in the background while i was working on other things but now i need to go back and intently watch it and uh yeah man i can't wait to do a video because i'm i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do a deep dive and a study of prehistoric egypt and i think it'd be really cool to give an anthropological perspective to this vase uh you know um theory or or just this it's it's fascinating yeah, you know totally. so yeah yeah, yeah yeah awesome awesome yeah, yeah cool so, man um, yeah we'll explore it further for sure <clears throat> yeah. yeah so um and i guess kind of uh i want to give people my view that i was talking about yesterday on 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 egypt mm -hmm. because i've kind of beat around the bush a little bit and uh <clears throat> and i've never i haven't quote unquote published this theory yet haven't put out a video on it um, but I'm happy to talk about it here. So in the time that I've studied Egypt, what I have come to believe is that all of these great mysteries that Ben and Randall and Graham point out, I think all of that is true. All of these things that are completely inexplicable, unexplainable, we don't have, we don't have evidence of the tools of how these were built, okay? I, I'm I'm not, you know, when I when I come out and say like I think that the Egyptians did do that, people go, people immediately jump to, oh, so you really think they did it with copper chisels and diorite pounding stones? No, 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 no. No. I agree with with Ben Randall and Graham on the inexplicable mysteries. From my perspective, with how much the Egyptians did do and how complex their history is, the the way I think about it is does it make more sense for me personally, given what I know and what I've what I've studied? Does it make more sense for me personally to look at these things and to immediately jump to the idea that a different culture did it? Or do I think that the Egyptians did do it and we had don't know how they did it? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. What's really weird is the second one sounds reasonable in my mind. 
it sounds almost overly reasonable. Egyptologists don't don't think like that. Mm -hmm. They they won't even accept that there is a means by which Egyptians did things that they can't explain. Right. <laughs> they have to know the answer. Right. Right. They right. and that makes them that makes them like insufferable to listen to. That's why people don't listen to, right. you know, traditional academics right. because their pride there's, is there's so no open, wrapped up. There's in no it. open mind to, to. No, no. Yeah. It's it's you're gonna believe what I say, or right. you're a pseudo scientist, right. a pseudo archaeologist, blah blah blah. Yeah, you confuse facts with beliefs. They <clears throat> confuse facts with beliefs. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so they create their own reality. <clears throat> and so where I come from, and Dr. Bob Breyer, my favorite Egyptologist ever. He believes this too, and I was so surprised to hear this in uh, in his lecture series. He has a lecture series called like the History of Ancient Egypt, and it's uh, fifty lectures long, and they're like an hour a piece. And uh, oh my god, it's it's the best. And um, and I disagree with him on some things, you know. Like he he really uh, he really minimizes the importance of the pyramids. Like like when he brings up the pyramids, he goes he he was like he's like the pyramids are great. They're a great work of art. You know, people talk about how uh, all the magical properties of the pyramids. He was like, the pyramids aren't magical, and the pyramids are not weren't special to the Egyptians. It was meant to protect the bodies, and he kind of minimizes the importance of it. I really disagree with with that. I think that they're obviously more important than that. Mm -hmm. um, but with so many things, I, I think it's fascinating. But he has this. He has like for one minute. He talks about in his lecture series, which is amazing because it was the same uh, suspicion that I've got that I, that I have. Um, for one minute, he talks about a cult of the pharaohs that safe that that guarded sacred knowledge all throughout the time of Egypt. And I'm guessing that that it ebbed and flowed, and how you know put together this sacred cult was, and and you know who knows, maybe they were all killed at some point. There's there's no telling what could have happened. Mm -hmm. So when I look at ancient Egypt. They were known by the Greeks. We know a lot about Egypt because of Greece. Right. You know, Greece is more recent than Egypt, and they did a wonderful job of documenting their history because writing was so prolific at this time. Mm -hmm. And the development of paper is so prolific at this time, or papyrus, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they're writing scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. I mean, people are writing like people are writing like Stephen King back then. Yeah. Um a lot of it was burned, right? I mean, what, like the uh Greece. Um I think I I'm sure I'm sure during times I'm not an expert in, in Greece, right. um, but are you talking about the Library of Alexandria? Yeah, or? yeah. I thought like ninety five percent of like <clears throat> of uh, of of it that has been lost. Well, okay, yeah. There's probably some statistics as far as like ninety five percent of ancient writings are lost. Yeah. I believe that. If you're talking about the Library of Alexandria, I think half of the library okay. was burned down. Okay. But the Library of Alexandria was in Egypt. It was in a, it was in a Greek city in Egypt, uh, Alexandria, named after Alexander the Great. He established that city, um, and that was in the that's on the most northern side of Egypt, on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, so that he could have a port for himself. But that was like the Nile Delta, and the Egyptians that's would good real estate. Yeah, yeah. The Egyptians yeah. would they didn't build their own city there because. They would have scouts that set out on the um, that set out on the coastline, and that delta area, those swamps. Have you seen it before? Like the top of it, how it kind of blooms out. Yep. Uh, all of those swamps are really tough to get through. So the Egyptians would sail back or ride their horses or whatever back down to Cairo, Memphis, and say, you know, invaders are coming through the sea, but it's going to take them a while to get here. But Alexander's like, no, I'm just going to build a city here, so so Greece can get into Egypt easily. Anyways, yeah. so um, <clears throat> Western democracy, our government today comes from Greece. You know, they created, quote unquote, they created our democracy. They did not. That the came Egyptians. from that came from Egypt. Yeah. Everything that Greece did, all of their all of their temples, you know, all, especially their pillars that are in their temples, all of that comes from Greece. So I mean, it comes from Egypt. So <clears throat> um, even when they, you know, the Olympic Games come from Greece, when they were trying to figure out, well. How are we going to allow people to compete fairly? Because other surrounding kingdoms, like like this is uh, Athens and Greece were two different city-states, but Athens wanted to compete and uh, the other local nations wanted to compete in the Olympic Games, but they couldn't figure out a way to rule the games fairly. So what do they do? They send, apparently it was so complicated that they needed to send scribes and representatives down to Egypt to speak to philosophers in Egypt who then told them the story, well, since Egypt's founding, Egypt was found on philosopher kings. 
and they were God kings, but they cared about philosophy. They cared about science. They cared about um, a lot of the theoretical metaphysical ideas that like made Nikola Tesla so fascinating. These are the kind of people that they were. They mm -hmm. were very hypothetical philosophy, you know, uh, philosophical, philosophical mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So that made Egypt really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. So Scorpion unites Egypt in 3100 BC. He is a philosopher king, you know, uh, supposedly of some kind. And um, and all of these kings are not the type of kings that the United States had to fight against or the colonies had to fight against King George, you know, these vainful kings. These are kings who are living basically on the frontier of history, trying to unite the first ever nation um, and make that nation great. So philosopher kings that care about right and wrong, that care about religion, that care about the, you know, uh, giving the people of their country the best life possible. But they also rule with an iron fist because they literally are a god. Egypt is the only place in the ancient world, in the old world, where a man could become a god. So you see an insane incline in, um, in their technology and their ability, you know, their craftsmanship. This is what I believe. You see, you see an insane incline, and it's almost like a lot of people say Egypt right at the beginning is really powerful. Well, from my point of view, it's not necessarily right at the beginning. Um, you, we look at one of those, uh, we looked at one of those vases that you showed me, which uh, I think was it, was it white granite, mm -hmm. where it was concave on the outside, but on the inside, it was a straight drill hole. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. 4,000 BC. Am yep. I crazy for saying no, that? No, you're right. Yeah. So 4,000 BC. It was interesting right before that I said, well, it's interesting that you don't see like straight drill holes where it goes straight in and out. Sure enough, there is one that's on there that is its range is older than the rest. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, that's showing us that they started here and we kind of see a progression where over the course of the next 500 to 700 years, they're, they're hollowing out the inside of these vases. So Egypt is kind of learning and advancing and in technology, and then they're united by a god king who brings absolute power, absolute control to Egypt, unites the land. Along the along the most powerful river of the ancient world, they're growing more grain than anywhere else in the ancient world. Technology is speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they get to the point where they really are building these pyramids, and there's an insane incline, like an exponential incline of uh, of technology. And the reason it seems like it's at the very beginning is because there's that dark period between Jozer and Scorpion, five or 600 years. But there really is a, there, it, it's not just a dark period. We just don't have evidence of that period. So people 2, say- 2500 to 3100 BC ish. Yeah, we don't have, you know, that 600 year period, we mm -hmm. don't have a lot of evidence of it. But now we have sufficient evidence to know that it wasn't a dark period. There was a lot going on at that time. Mm -hmm. So you see this like, this exponential incline in technology as you see everywhere else in the world when a nation becomes powerful. And so what I think is during that time, I think that there were sacred cults of the pharaohs that safely guarded um, concepts of, let's say, mathematics, human anatomy, sacred geometry, which is mathematics, religion, the engineering, yeah. mm -hmm. the afterlife, astronomy. You know, <clears throat> astronomy. Mm -hmm. They safely guarded these things, and they used this knowledge of definitely engineering and craftsmanship. And, but I think that they safely guarded this knowledge because it elevated Egypt above the rest of the world. This is where our, our king is actually a god. You, all of your kings are a normal man. Mm -hmm. We have the Nile River. You guys have streams, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm and mud brick buildings. And so Egypt was elevated above the rest of the world. And I think that there were sacred cults that safely guarded this knowledge in, in you know, in, in these temples where it, what they knew was only written down maybe just a few times, you know? Well, the reason that we see this big fall off in technology, you know, that's what a lot of people say is, is there's, there's this huge fall off. And then after the old kingdom, you don't see it anymore. That's true. What happens is we know that there are these, uh, papyri or papyrus scrolls being sent out from normal people who lived in the uh, who lived in Egypt writing to people who lived in the Middle East and sometimes they would write on clay tablets sometimes it would be in a papyrus they'd send it out and they would say Egypt is upside down it's being ruled by foreigners nothing is the way it used to be everything is backwards um, you know where is the time of Seneferu because Seneferu the great pyramid builder, he was known as being a great, wonderful, very nice pharaoh. There's a, there's a, there's a great story of him that I'll share someday, um, of the type of person that he was.
but e that's not happening anymore. And the proposed reasoning for this is that Egypt needed a young, vigorous ruler to stay to rule with an iron fist and stay on top of everything, and to be ahead of of military, um, of like military battles and skirmishes. You know, with these barbarians trying to attack him because those barbarians are still there. Well, you have invaders who come in again from the Middle East and they ransack Egypt during a time when Egypt's pharaoh, Pepi II, is in his late 70s, late 80s. He's, he's like an absent ruler. And so the power of Egypt wanes. And then all of a sudden, Egypt for 300 years, the amount of time the United States has been around, mm -hmm. more than the amount of time the United States has been around, is ruled by outside forces. During those 300 years, well, you can guarantee that Egyptian temples holding the most sacred of documents were burned to the ground, destroyed. Their documents were either stolen or burned by the foreigners, or they were hidden away by, by the Egyptians who were there at the time of these cults, hidden in a place that these barbarians who they thought, you know, or who they saw as barbarians coming in from the Middle East would never be able to use this to use this kind of knowledge or technology. So I think that personally, uh, and I'm not obviously not set in stone on all my yeah. opinions, but it's just yeah. kind of my, it's a good my my personal theory yeah. is I think the Egyptians did it, and I think they purposely hid the way that they did it in sacred cults, mm -hmm. and we have we have a lot of the evidence of that because Hermeticism in ancient e or in ancient Greece, the like uh, the Pythagorean theorem, right. everything that Greece knew came from came from Greek scholars coming to Egypt and writing down everything that the Egyptians taught them and taking them back right. to Egypt. Pythagoras now, took a trip to Egypt right before he came back and and taught sacred geometry and created a school and, yep. and formed a religion of, of yep. uh, focused on the afterlife. Yeah, and, and that and that hurt that those hermetics hermeticism that that's kind of that cult in Greece comes from the cult of the pharaohs mm -hmm. that. We attribute, and, that, and, and I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. uh, Pythagoras was 500 BC, around that time. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was around the time of Herodotus. Herodotus was 450. Okay. So you know, around the time that a lot of Greeks are traveling to Egypt and bringing back that culture with yeah, them. Yeah. Um, and Egypt was just freely giving it to them, I guess. At that point, we don't know. I mean, there's no. There's um. No well, I mean, it's probably not so much. It's probably not so much like. Herodotus arrives in Egypt and like knocks on a door. It, it was yeah. probably there rep were representatives from Greece and Egypt that knew each other. And there was probably a trade of some mm -hmm. kind, like mm -hmm. uh, Greece will give Egypt, you know, X amount of drugs. Yeah, something <laughs> like that. You know, X amount of, of what it is that you want to teach us, you know, teach us about, about your mathematics, your sacred geometry, blah, blah, blah. But it probably wasn't like, he arrives at the Library of Alexandria and he learns what everybody else gets to learn. Yeah. It's probably a great trade of some kind. Yeah, that much. And <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And these uh and and these sacred cults that guarded this kind of knowledge that only the people immediately around the pharaoh, there probably had to be some great trade of some kind for a Pythagoras to be able to go to Egypt and learn this most safely or sacredly guarded knowledge. And so I think that after the time of the first intermediate period in Egypt, we call it the intermediate period, but it's really a fall of Egypt for 300 years. They're ruled by barbarians and foreigners from an outside land and, and Egyptian religion is gone. Mm -hmm. So 300 something years later, people, you know, the Egyptians revolt and take back Egypt. That's not the same Egypt that was ruling there 300 years before. So they kind of, it, it's like a whole new civilization. You know, they, they're, um, they're still able to read hieroglyphs. Um, there are still surviving, you know, papyrus and documents that have been hidden. I'm sure have been hidden in caches that people have known about for 300 years, you right. know, and then when the, all these, you know, foreigners are kicked out of the land, they go and dig all this stuff back up and start reading it, but they got to teach themselves again. And you never see you know, in the Middle Kingdom, um, you have the Middle Kingdom that goes on for several hundred years, um, you know, five, six hundred, seven hundred years it goes on. And you never see Egypt return to the greatness of the Old Kingdom, yeah. where they're building as much as they used to be. Now, they're a very conservative nation in, in, the, uh, in the Middle Kingdom, and their economy does really well because of that, because they don't have a lot of these big building projects going on. Um, but you never see a return to this kind of ancient sacred knowledge that you could see exponentially increasing from 3100 BC to the collapse of the old kingdom 
sometime leading up to about 2000 BC. So you have 1100 years of civilization that's like right at the end of that, whoom, this big spike in technology. It's 1100 years for the Egyptians to learn how to make something like this. Right. I right. totally think that they could learn, well, I say it's 1100 years. They were doing this at the beginning of that 1100 years. Yeah, um, yeah true, true. Before that beginning of that 1100 years. But 1100 years to learn how to build a pyramid? Sure. You mm -hmm. know, I don't think that, I don't think that that's, um, impossible, but we certainly don't know the means by which they did it. Right. Probably, I think, on purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my take on that's my take on ancient Egypt. So I'd cool. I tried to not like, um, you know, I'm not diminishing the grand ideas that people have about it being twelve thousand years old. I all the allure is still there. You're, all of, you're there with the Sphinx. It seems like <clears throat> I am. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's possible that the Sphinx. I think it's what I think when when I really think about that. But then I have to consider, you know, the Serapium and and the uh, Osiris shaft and, and these other places that are very strange and I think could be as old as the Sphinx is. Mm -hmm. But but just focusing on the Sphinx, what I think about that when I just isolate that and theorize about it, I think that maybe it was some kind of geological feature that may have been exposed at one point in time in these very ancient Egyptians, maybe twelve thousand years ago walk by it they're certainly aware of lions and maybe maybe this natural formation they're like this looks exactly like a lion yeah. you know yeah. maybe this is some kind of sacred place i wouldn't be surprised at all going super hypothetically i would not be surprised at all if twelve thousand years ago there were people walking by this cliffside next to the nile and they look up you know because yeah. the, the the geology is completely different at that time and they look up or, or on, you know, on this Giza plateau, there's something there, this formation that already looks like a lion. Good. So they carve a lion into it and Good they day. stay there and work, they stay there and worship that. Yeah. And there's been habitation there ever since. I mean, they, they, they did, they did, you know, <clears throat> hollow out the ground right next oh, to the yeah. Sphinx and just re remove a ton, a ton of limestone to make it just a beautiful you know, <clears throat> structure and well, perfect, good, good <clears throat> symmetry on the, yeah, you know, the temple. And, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's so ancient that, you know, uh, I think it's been said, there's documentation that the Egyptians were repairing the Sphinx before the Sphinx was ever supposed to be built. <laughs> right, right. So I wouldn't be surprised from a totally pragmatic point of view. Let's call it like a, let's make up something because this is what archaeologists do all the time. Yeah. Let's call it like a lioness cult. You know, it, it's, it was originally, I think, a lion, but a female lion. Mm -hmm. um, what if, you know, it could have been some kind of lioness cult that had been there for, 12,000 years and they see that it's a lion and definitely they're studying the stars at this point in time. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, but there's also lions in Africa. <clears throat> there's yeah. also lions in Africa. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the, the lion, if it is a lion, the Sphinx face in 10,500 BC, it faced the constellation of Leo. Leo yeah. And if, and if the recognition of constellations goes back that far, which it, which absolutely does. One hundred percent with Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Gobekli Tepe isn't that far from Egypt. Right. Exactly. So, I would not be surprised at all if there was a cult of a lioness that emerged there, and there were people. There had been people there living in Giza from twelve thousand or twelve thousand years ago, all the way up to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so that Sphinx is carved and carved and carved. That makes the most sense to me in my mind. I don't know about the Serapium. I don't know about the Osiris shaft, yeah. but I definitely think there could have been a cult of the lioness or a cult of the Sphinx that had been living there for 12,000 something years. Yeah. And they just constantly repaired it, repaired it, repaired it. And then some, somewhere, somewhere along the way, a Pharaoh was like, I want to build, you know, I yeah. want to build here. I don't yeah. know. That's yeah. like my yeah. pragmatic view of it. Interesting. Yeah, the Serapium is interesting <clears throat> just because of the huge, massive, bo the, the, the the boxes that are in there. Of oh, course, yeah, you know, yeah. With the, similar to the same level of precision that you see on a lot of the vases. <clears throat> I mean... Well, which, and, and how do you... How do you get the mass of the box out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it, the it comes from a solid right. block. Right. How does the extraction take yeah. place? And where did it go? I, I mean, you know... Where is it? Yeah, yeah where is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. yeah, where is the rubble or the remains of of where that is? That I don't think it's ever been located. No, and that is a ton of granite and diorite, right? Just laying around somewhere. Yeah, that's interesting. I need to yeah. see if there's a study on on that. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. So that's, next episode. That's that's my <laughs> view on that's my view on 
sort of explaining like a very pragmatic cool. explanation of the of the lost uh, knowledge of ancient Egypt and, and how they did these things. I think it was purposely hidden, safely guarded. It's mm -hmm. what made Egypt special. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I think that the Egyptians who did it knew it blew people's minds. Yeah. And there's no way that that was ever going to be let out to anybody. So it's, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, what you were, what you were talking about being underneath the Sphinx? Yeah. Um, maybe. Yeah, could, you have, know, could have there, been where it was. There's a, what, that's a, that's supposed to be Thoth's uh, chamber, right. or the uh, chamber of, lost chamber of Thoth or something like that, um, where, you know, perhaps the sacred knowledge of Egypt, it was put in an underground chamber beneath the Sphinx. Um, Zahi Awas certainly denies that there's anything there. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think he's the most uh, right. trustworthy guy. Oh, what's and, down this path? Oh, we've <clears throat> never been down there. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, yeah, we're yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's like a there's like a piece of tape that goes over right. and he goes, he goes, Oh, down here? We've never walked down there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> there's nothing right. down there. Yeah, no. Um, no. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just it's we don't insane. need to get into that guy, but man, the uh yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't even go down that route. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So yeah. but Man, but but the uh, one last thing, one last mm -hmm. thought that I had as you were talking earlier, and you know, I kind of joked about uh, potentially the Greeks. You know, how, how did they get the knowledge from the Egyptians? You know, mm -hmm. and poten drugs. You know, potentially drugs. Mm -hmm. But but if you look at, are you familiar with Brian Murarescu? No, I'm not. Uh, okay, so he wrote a book called The Immortality Key. I've seen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, okay, I get what you're saying now. Yeah. 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 So he he um, he's done a lot of incredible research about the use of psychedelic drugs mm -hmm. in um, in ancient history amongst the Greeks. Um, specifically, and he's gone back in time to look at the possibility of that, and he's uncovered some incredible, incredible evidence that it's that that's um, that that's a fact, and that they would um, take trips to Eleusis, um, journeys to Eleusis, and that's where um, that's where that it, it would happen that they would have these visions. And, and these, where is that? Eleusis in Greece. Um, it's, okay, okay, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah, and um, so the Greeks were very, very likely mm -hmm. um, using um, psychedelic drugs. Um, you oh, know, I, mushrooms! I one hundred percent believe um, it. That that could very well be what you know a, a comp complete speculation, but but certainly yeah. could be uh, a way that if you wanted to get some ancient knowledge out of Egypt, you know, um, offer them some of that stuff. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and it's it's obvious, like in in Egyptian hieroglyphs they depict plants that we know today to have psychedelic effects, okay, you know? Okay. And, um, so they were already in on that. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, maybe so, but also being in Greece, perhaps there are plants growing there naturally that have, you know, much stronger effects than in Egypt. It's kind of, for whatever reason, it's taboo to talk about psychedelics it is, yeah. as though it's, you know, but when you look at the that's when you, changing when you yeah oh yeah for yeah. sure and and uh and in due part to joe rogan from right. popularizing it and right. uh and graham too mm -hmm. um <clears throat> but when you look at the all of the ancient world this is kind of what i think it, and i i have this is again something i've never quite gotten into because i just don't know how i feel about it um when you look at all of the ancient world look at the marvels that people constructed in the name of their gods, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they would build buildings and then give up the credit of the building to their gods. So clearly, at some point, there's some kind of very strong connection to whatever these deities are. And so let's, uh, let's look at the Bible. What happens in the Bible? You know, what has to happen in the Bible for Moses to speak to God. There has to be a bush burning. What happens when there's bush burning? There's smoke. You inhale the smoke. You know, you inhale a lot of smoke uh, from a lot of different things. You see things. And um, and so I definitely think that hallucinogens and psychedelics are deeply embedded into our DNA somewhere mm -hmm. and could be the thing that gave like very ancient apes sentience. You know, mm -hmm. they, they start, possible, they start yeah. messing with the uh, hallucinogens in our minds wake up, you know, yeah. and, and made us as intelligent as we are today. Yeah. Not, um, not only the burning bush, but it would mm -hmm. also have the power to change water to wine. And, yeah. And um, it would also, um, um, you know, potentially um, make a blind man be able to see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, and, and, and potentially be a first sacrament. So, Very interesting. Uh, a, yeah, a way yeah. A uh, way to convert people to religion. So yeah, yeah. That, Brian gets into a lot of that in his book. And I need to read that. I, yeah. I get asked about the immortality key all the time, but it's I just really haven't good. read it. It's really good. So I, I think I think psychedelics are probably are probably deeply rooted in all civilizations. I think so too. You know. Yeah. So um, 
But that's a conversation for another yeah, time. Another yeah, another episode. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, cool, man. So, that was awesome. Love yes, to explore in Egypt with you, brother. That was yeah, really, man. really cool. I, I feel like we barely scratched the I know, surface. I know. I know. Me too. Me but, too. Um, but this was great, man. And thank you for bringing me on and and uh, flying me down. And and uh, this has been this has really been so flattering. And getting to see your collection is like, um, you opened my. I, I just didn't realize even last night at dinner. I just didn't realize the significance of these and you can't until you see it with your own eyes and hold it yeah you know yeah um so thank you for this this yeah. has been great hell yeah man i appreciate you coming on here getting the uh getting the channel off to a great start it's been a, a lot of fun talking to you and yes sir. Yeah, let's dive into uh we'll take a little break and uh we'll we'll get into mesoamerica a little bit yes. as, as part two yeah absolutely all right awesome all right, man. thank you awesome appreciate it <laughs> that's a wrap